Okay, well, welcome everybody. Um, I think I'll get started here and we'll probably have people kind of popping on as I get started with the presentation. Um, this is the presentation for Get Schooled, Educational Accommodations and Advocacy for Children Diagnosed with Thyroid Cancer. So hopefully you're in the right spot. Um, my name is Pam Mendenhall and figure out how to work my computer here. Um, I've been a volunteer um, with the FICA organization agency probably for about 15 years. Um, my daughter, Alyssa, was diagnosed with thyroid cancer when she was only 10. It was follicular thyroid cancer. Uh, she had found a nodule. And um, of course, like many of you, I freaked out. <laughs> Took her to the doctor, um, found out after having her thyroid removed, it was cancer, unfortunately. Um, She's currently though 26 years old um, and she's doing very well. Um, she's managed um, everything um, pretty well up until that point. Of course, a child being diagnosed, diagnosed with thyroid cancer, you have a lot of ups and downs um, with regulating synthroid dosages um, and things like that, but she's, she's doing very well, I'm happy to say. I also happen to be a school social worker um, and this is, my 29th year um, at the agency I work at. So I thought this presentation kind of went together um, for me being the mother of um, someone who had thyroid cancer and also working in the school system um, with children with disabilities. Um, I also too throughout this presentation um, would welcome any questions that you might have. And I told um, Jim, who is kind of our moderator here, he's, he's gonna be helping me out. Um, to field some of those questions because it's kind of hard to do the presentation and, and look at the chat and the questions right offhand. But um, anyway, feel free to chime in at, at any point during the conversation. Um, this is the, kind of a funny slide. Um, you've been asleep for like a hundred years. Why don't you get up, shut up and get me my thyroid pills? Well, I don't know if, if you had thyroid cancer or your child, but um, my daughter was always tired <laughs> from, you know, 10 through probably till about 22, 23, getting that regulated. Um, she was tired quite a bit. So this kind of rang home for me. Um, as parents try to help their child deal with thyroid cancer diagnosis, the potential difficulties of managing school while their child does not feel well, they should make themselves aware of section 504 as well as health plans. So the school system I work at um, and any school system um, has legislation that we call um, fi a 504 um, Disabilities Act. And again, that's federal legislation um, that's available to any student with a disability. Also in my school district, we have things called individual health plans, which is what my daughter had, um, which basically uh, maps out the accommodations um, that your child may need while they're off medication, um, on a low iodine diet, um, at any point in their schooling. And I thought it was important to do this presentation because unfortunately, even though I'd been in this, working in the school system, um, when my daughter was going through a lot of this um, in fifth, sixth, seventh grade, um, the middle school had, they were basically refusing to accommodate her while she was off of her medication. Um, and going through her scan and things like that, which, which kind of made me angry. And I thought parents should really know their rights um, and the types of legislation that's out there to help them and their children. So we'll start with section 504 plans. 504 is a part of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973 that basically prohibits discrimination um, based upon a disability. An impairment as used in section 504 may include any disability, long-term illness, various disorders that, and the word is substantially in there, reduces or lessens a student's ability to access learning in the educational setting because of a learning behavior or a health-related condition. And those plans too, as I'll talk about later on, will be individual um, for your child. It's an anti-discrimination legislation that requires the schools to meet the needs of students with disabilities. Every school district addresses Section 504 in a different manner. 
Um, compliance to Section 504, which is federal statute, is not optional, as some districts may claim. Um, some smaller districts may claim that, but again, this is federal legisla legislation and a fed federal statute. Section 504 plans are formal plans that schools develop to give children with disabilities the support they need. So again, these plans are gonna look different for each child. They're gonna be very individualized too for each student. Um, I also, um, if you would like a copy of this presentation, I can send that out to you. I have examples of 504 plans um, and an example of what our school district uses um, as part of their 504 plan. Um, to look at uh, whether or not a child would be eligible for that, um, what accommodations are needed, and it, there's, it's pages and pages long. So um, our 504 plans in our district are pretty lengthy. The goal of a 504 plan is basically to level the playing field by providing accommodations and modifications that allow students the same opportunities as their typical peers. So it's not for them to get more instruction or go above and beyond. It's to level that playing field with their other peers while they're going through, um, you know, it could be, you know, the Synthroid withdrawal, scans, whatever the case may be. These plans prevent discrimination as they protect the rights of children with disabilities. Um, I also, if you'd like a copy of the presentation, um, I have the legislation here cited um, that you can click on and, and kind of look at that. And it's not a civil rights law, but it is federal. Who develops the plans? Um, thyroid cancer treatments can have adverse effects, as we all know, um, on learning, both short-term and long-term. So, and my daughter experienced a lot of these problems too, but children may experience problems with attention span, cognition, their energy level, concentration, executive functioning, which is kind of like initiating tasks and organizing, problems with their working memory, um, being able to remember things that they recently heard. Again, problems with planning, self-regulation, um, and emotional control. I know that my daughter, um, when she, whenever she went off of her medication um, to have her scan and her thyroglobulin levels, she was just unable to concentrate. Um, she could, couldn't focus to do her schoolwork and she was usually a, a straight A student. Um, I remember us sitting down trying to play a card game of Uno and she couldn't even do that with me. Um, you know, when her TSH levels started to rise you know, into the 30, 40 kind of range. Um, she was, just could not concentrate. Why develop these plans? Um, children could need accommodations again before surgery. Um, like on the low iodine diet, my daughter had to take um, a lunch into school when she was on the low iodine diet. You know, they had to keep that in the refrigerator in the nurse's office and they had a heated up for her, um, do those accommodations. Um, she also had accommodations too, because she was very tired during the day. So we had it set up that she could take a nap if she needed to. Um, other accommodations, um, numerous absences due to doctor's appointments, surgeries, um, and treatments. So we had also set up when she could no longer attend school, um, had the teachers, uh, I picked up her homework um, and brought it home for her. So those accommodations. Long-term, children may need long-term accommodations while going through treatment. And again, adjusting the TSH levels. Um, sometimes that's not easy, um, especially for children um, who are growing. You know, my, like I said, my 10 year old um, had thyroid cancer and also my youngest who was six had her thyroid removed because she had a nodule too. It was not cancer, um, but having to regulate, um, you know, that medication <laughs> from six years old up uh, while they're growing is, is very difficult. Uh, finding the appropriate TSH level may take weeks or even months to establish. Establishing 504 plans can begin with a letter from the child's doctor, which is what we did, um, describing the condition, how it will affect school performance, and it's usually developed before the student returns back to school. Um, we did it 
when we found out that she was diagnosed with cancer and when I knew what the ramifications would be because I knew she would need to be out, you know, for the scan would need to be out, um, would be very tired. Um, so we kind of started before that with a letter from the doctor and how we do it in our school district is we have somebody who's responsible at each school for writing those 504 plans. And sometimes it's the counselor, sometimes it's the nurse. Um, your district should have somebody assigned to write those plans. Parents, teachers, and other school personnel work together to determine the scope of services needed uh, for the child to return to school. It's usually accepted practice that the 504 plans are reviewed every year. Um, however, no regulations exist. I know with an IEP, which is what yeah, I primarily work with in, in my area of social work, the individual education plan, those have to be reviewed annually, um, but 504s do not but it is good practice and we do review them at least annually in our school district. A good 504 should include um, whether or not they're eligible, the accommodations, the teacher responsibility, student responsibility, and parent guardian responsibility. And I'll go over each of those separately. So the criteria for eligibility, like I said before, it has to be a mental or physical impairment substantially um, limiting the individual in one or more major life activities. Accommodations, justifications. Um, accommodations, again, don't change what children learn, just how they learn it. So again, the goal is to remove the barriers and provide children access to learning Again, so they're on a level playing field with their peers. These accommodations can include changes to the environment, um, like taking tests in a quiet place. I know that with my daughter, um, we had in her, her, her health plan, she didn't have a 504 plan, but she had a health plan that around the time of her um, withdrawing of medication, that she would not take any tests or any important tests. Um, so we waited until after she was back on her medication, it was regulated for her um, to take any of that testing because it really wasn't fair to make her do that while she was off of her medication. Uh, changes to instruction, um, checking in frequently on key, key concepts too. Um, some kids, they may give them an outline um, of what to do um, as far as like tests or, um, any notes they need to take. Changes is how the curriculum is presented. Again, getting notes, getting things in writing. Or I know some parents have told me that um, some of the teachers taped, if you're in middle school or high school, have taped their, um, their classes for them so they're able to listen to it. Also, some kids now, especially with COVID, um, have Zoomed in to, to their classes, even though they can't make it physically into school teachers have allowed them to zoom into their um, classes. So that's really helpful. Make sure the accommodations are designed to address specific major life activities, um, designed to meet the individual's educational needs, equal again to that of non-disabled students, written clearly, specifically. Um, also, you, want, you don't wanna put everything in there in the kitchen sink. I mean, you want to be very specific, uh, you know, there's, you don't wanna to have too many things in there. Otherwise teachers may not follow through and you don't want things in there that aren't necessary because you still want your child to maintain some um, sense of independence. Teacher responsibility, make sure teachers understand the accommodations. Teachers legally must follow through with the accommodations. Um, and if teachers don't, um, then you go to the principal and <laughs> it's the principal's responsibility to make sure the teachers follow through. Again, ensure open communication. Um, we had a lot of emails going back and forth between myself um, and my daughter's teacher and the nurse to make sure things got done. And I updated them frequently. Um, make sure they're implemented too with fidelity. Student responsibility, make sure they understand their responsibilities too and give them written reminders if they need it. Parent guardian responsibility, 
Um, again, I did this a lot. Make sure medical information is communicated with the teacher. I provided them with frequent updates whenever there was a doctor's appointment. Um, again, we wanna make this individual for each child and just get them what they need and make sure teachers are updated with any changes in medical status. Okay, next, I'll talk about individual health plans. This is what my daughter had. So an individual health plan, and we call them IHPs in my district, is a plan that a registered nurse develops. Um, and basically it's for the school um, and parents, and I guess the child in some ways to be accountable um, for any actions, inactions, you know, that, that we need to do. So the schools, again, must officially comply with the IHP requirements. So an IHP is not backed by federal legislation. Again, it's a plan um, that usually, you know, the parents, nurse, teacher, um, anyone else involved um, contributes to the, the development of that plan. And again, it's similar to a 504 in that it talks about, you know, what accommodations, modifications that might be needed um, while the student is going through uh, treatment, um, thyroid hormone regulation, any of that. So a health plan serves both the student and the school. Um, so it, get, it also, which is really nice, I think it gives the school and the parents an opportunity to actually sit down, you know, face to face, hopefully talk with staff, the nurse, um, just about what's going on with the student and then uh, some expectations and responsibilities. It clarifies important things like how medication will be administered. Um, I know with my daughter, in case I forgot to give her her Synthroid in the morning, I had some extra at school. Um, so, you know, you could have that in the plan. Um, how the student's health status will be monitored. The nurse should be aware of that. The location provided, who will be providing the care. It should provide for staff training. Um, so if a teacher, um, you know, will need to know, hey, if the student is tired and they need to see the nurse or take a nap, you know, you need to let them go. I know with my daughter too, after her radioactive iodine treatment, um, we gave her a lot of water. She was allowed to have like a water bottle at school. Now I think that's, that's pretty common, um, but back then it was a big no-no to have a water bottle at your desk. So they allowed her to do that. Um, the individual health plan, again, like the 504 plan, it varies from state to state, district to district. Um, Individual health plans are developed by the school district. And again, like I said, there's no state or federal protection um, that comes with an individual health plan. And it can be used alone or with a 504 plan, but a lot of times they're pretty repetitive. Um, if your child's circumstances change or you're not satisfied with the staff response, um, you can always request a meeting with the school. Um, just like a, an IEP, an individual education plan, you can always request a meeting with staff. Um, if you think an accommodation isn't getting implemented, there's a big change you want to let people know about, you can always request that meeting. Uh, so with the 504 or the individual health plan, um, I would encourage parents to, and I've done this, write down questions ahead of time. And I always do that for doctor's appointments too, um, because sometimes I get really nervous. <laughs> so um, I thought I need to write everything down just to make sure I get all my questions answered. Take notes, which I do. Um, and again, for like the 504 plan, it's good practice with the health plan um, to do, to review it annually. And also bring an advocate to the meeting. And this little picture here kind of reminds me of I feel bad for parents. I'm in a lot of IEPs um, during the day and this little picture is a school staff. I'm not sure why Mr. Barth always feels compelled to bring an advocate to the IEP meeting, <laughs> outnumbered. So like I said, I kind of feel bad for parents because there's usually about seven or eight of us school staff and then there's the parent and maybe one other person. So. You know, always bring an advocate um, if you feel you need to, a husband, wife, a sibling, uh, you know, your mother, your father, 
um, sister, brother, anybody, two sets of ears um, is always better than one. Accommodations may be used, um, but are not limited to shortened or modified assignments, a modified schedule. Um, usually, I mean, it's really hard for schools to do this, but it would be nice if like the more difficult subjects um, were held when the student was more alert. My daughter was more alert in the morning and tended to fade as the day went on. Um, extended time on tests or assignments. Obviously, she could not do all of her assignments in the allotted time when she was off of her medication, so we needed those extended. Um, so taking tests uh, might have peer assistance with note taking, um, extra set of textbooks, although this, that's kind of old because now they can send everything home electronically. Um, additional time, again, to complete assignments. Uh, we had a homeschool communication log too that was really helpful. If I was noticing anything at home or um, if they were had any notes to give me at school, we would have a log that went back and forth. And again, rearranging class schedules, although that's very difficult to do. Um, limited physical activities like modified PE. Again, my daughter was so tired. Um, she had a hard time participating. Um, access to a refrigerator, which we requested um, because with the low iodine diet, diet she needed a separate lunch. Um, taping lectures, um, but again, you know that, and a lot of students can participate via Zoom. Taking tests orally instead of writing them down. Um, and like we did with my daughter, delaying formal district-wide testing or other standardized tests until the child, until their thyroid levels are back to normal and stable. Um, provide for rest time, like I talked about before, if they're too tired. Um, I had talked about this too, allowing them to drink water or have snacks uh, to maintain that energy level. And waive penalties regarding absenteeism. Um, I remember <laughs> that my daughter got um, a letter that she was absent um, too often during that time. And so I called and I said, she has cancer, you know, she needs to be gone. And their response was, well, we can't keep track of everybody. So it needs to go, these letters need to go out, which I was pretty upset about and kind of wrote a rebuttal to them um, that went in her file. But um, so obviously they're gonna be absent. Um, they're gonna be late for their assignments. Um, shortened days, um, which my daughter did, a lot of times she came home at noon towards the end. Um, have one contact person in school to help collection of assignments. That's really helpful. Um, at the middle school, we had the nurse um, who was that person who collected everything. Slow return back after treatment, which we did. We started half days for a couple of days and then went full days. Um, again, access to recorded lectures, um, whatever she missed, we would try to get. And again, um, I have a parent and educator resource guide to section 504. If you wanna look at that, I can send you out a copy of the presentation. So big but here, again, like what I talked about before, don't add any accommodations if they aren't necessary. It could impede their independence, yeah, um, waste teachers time doing unneeded accommodations. And I know teachers are busy enough um, it's more difficult for teachers to remember if there's a ton of accommodations. And again, you want to maintain as much of a sense of normalcy as possible during this time. So again, just a little slide here. <laughs> I love how people understand that thyroid disease is a life-altering chronic illness, which if you haven't been there, I don't know that you quite understand it. Even myself, you know, my daughter had it and I don't pretend to understand everything that she's went through and everything that she's still probably going through. Um, and again, if you want to copy the slide presentation, I have an example of a 504, the format that our district uses as well as the individual health plan. As a parent, um, if you think it's not being followed, um, you have the right to file a complaint with your school if you, again, believe they're not in compliance. Um, so I know that our district um, has, they're kind of like in the, at the human resources, human rights, equity um, kind of 
field at our main office and they would be the person that you would file a complaint to but and I know that would be a last resort because you know you don't want to make waves with the school district um, but sometimes unfortunately you have to so again not every disability is visible and I think it's important for us um, as parents to or caregivers to educate teachers because I've worked in the education field for 29 years now, and I know I appreciate it when a student has a medical condition and the parent brings in information, um, whatever diagnosis they may ha might have. They may say, oh, well, these are the symptoms. You need to do this. You need to accommodate by doing this. I mean, because I think teachers want to learn and want to know what to do. But like I said, it's our job as parents and, and caregivers to educate them um, regarding what our child needs because you know we need to be advocates for our children and we know our children better than anybody else does. <laughs> Hi, how are you? Good, how are you, Teresa? Good, good. So uh, my son, he just, we're just new to this whole thing. Uh, he had a 3.4 like mass that they surgically removed half his thyroid on the 2nd of September. And he okay. came back as, um, follicular thyroid carcinoma mm -hmm. and um, so we're just starting the process with that they they told us we need to remove the other half uh, mm -hmm. once he's healed from the surgery mm -hmm. and so you know the 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 teachers could see you know he had obviously had the surgeries going back um, just kind of wanting to get a feel for like the adjustment phase of having it removed and and getting on that thyroid medication, mm -hmm. would you say that it, it's a long process? Mm -hmm. um, I would say it's probably different for each child. Um, I know when my daughter, um, and she's had, we had her scanned when she was like 10 and then 12 and then like 14. So she's been off of her medication three different times. I know, I know that whenever, um, that right after they were done with the scan, they gave her T3 medication called Cytomil, and that really helped boost her up. Um, so she was able to be more attentive, stay on task more, just really helped with those kind of executive functioning skills like organization and planning. Um, mm -hmm. So that medication really helped her. They, they gave it to her concurrently or with um, the regular Synthroid or Levothyroxine, you know, whatever you're using, which is the T4. Um, so they gave her the Cytomil for, I think it was for about six to 10 days. Um, and that really kind of helped her jumpstart back into school. Okay. Um, so, you know, that, and I'm not a doctor, um, you mm -hmm. know, but that may be something, something to ask about um, to help, you know, get them back into class a little bit faster. I know we started slowly to um, like I said, we started with some half days and then gradually um, built up. So we've, like I said in the presentation, we've adjusted her med medication kind of through college. <laughs> she's okay. 26 now and she's to the point where she's, she's pretty stable. You know, she doesn't need a whole lot of changes. But, you know, I think college brings kind of a whole new, you know, set mm -hmm. of issues and circumstances. But I mean, I think it's important, um, you know, when they're younger, you know, especially when she was 10, 11, 12, to get that TSH checked. Um, I think we went in about every three months or so, uh, okay. just because they're growing so fast um, and there's so many changes. And, you know, you want to hit that sweet spot, which is kind of difficult because once you hit that sweet spot, then it's like, oh, they're growing more. Oh, you know, they might need a little bit more synthroid. So I think just to kind of keep on top of that. And another piece of advice I would give is don't just look at a number. Um, mm -hmm. you know, when you get that TSH results back, um, it could be like 0.4 or something, but the child could be saying, I'm really tired. You know, my hair is falling out. I can't concentrate. Well, you know, each child is different. I think it has to be based on those clinical symptoms and how the child feels mm -hmm. and not just a number. Okay. Some doctors are reluctant to do that, I think. <laughs> um, 
So if, if that helps, and again, I would make sure that if they need accommodations that the school is doing that. Um, again, I, I had to get kind of assertive with my school, which was really disheartening for me because I worked in that district for so long. And I thought, you know, if parents, families are going through enough at this time to deal with, you shouldn't have to deal with, you know, badgering the school right. uh, to do those accommodations. Right. Does that help? Does that answer sure. your question at all? It sure does. It sure does. I appreciate okay. that. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Anything else, Teresa, or is, is, I don't know if Doug is on here, Jim, I see. A... Yeah, actually, uh, Doug just posed the question on the Q&A here. Oh, your... sorry. Okay. Oh, no problem. I can read that out if you, if you like. Uh, did your child experience any behavioral problems at school? If so, how did you navigate those challenges? Um, she didn't have any behavior problems. Um, I guess, I guess it depends on how you define behavior. Um, you know, she did, she was very tired. She didn't participate. She, you know, she didn't get her work done. I think she was probably too tired to be, <laughs> you know, um, overly aggressive, you know, or anything like that. And I don't know if you feel comfortable sharing, um, and maybe you don't, that's fine. Kind of what, what the behavior problems were specifically, maybe we can brainstorm some solutions. Uh, he's unfortunately, uh, no mic or camera uh, okay. today, but he was just sharing, um, my son will have his first surgery later. Okay. Yeah. And, you know, it can, when you're off that medication, it can change. And, I, you know, the opposite is true. I guess the behavior problems may come in is when you're kind of trying to regulate that thyroid medication, if they're on too much medication, um, because that can look like kind of like attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Um, I know with my youngest, um, my oldest was, she was kind of pretty stable. Um, my youngest tended to be a little spitfire. So we had her thyroid out too when she was six because she had a nodule. And um, when her when we gave her too much medication, she was more a lot more spunky. She was a lot more kind of hyperactive. And I would say she was more talkative and probably more likely, you know, to talk back to teachers and you know, to have more of those behavior problems. And usually when we adjust to the medication, it kind of calmed her back down again. So again, I think it's important to, you know, monitor those TSH levels along with, you know, their kind of clinical symptoms or how they're feeling. And the, this, this is actually kind of a funny story. So, you know, my daughters, when they had their thyroids out, they were six and 10 and um, they saw the same endocrinologist. And whenever we would go there, um, my 10 year old would tell the endocrinologist, um, yeah, I think my little sister needs a decrease in medication. Her, her behaviors are worse or something like that. So she could tell by her behavior um, whether or not her, her little sister's medication needed to be increased or decreased. So that was kind of our joke. And Douglas was also inquiring. Um, he was curious if your child experienced bullying or other social problems relating to the life change of surgery and medication? Yeah, um, she did not as a result of that um, prior to that time though. And actually it kind of calmed down a bit after her diagnosis and I'm not sure why, but um, she was the target of some bullying. Um, my oldest tended to be kind of a nerd. Um, <laughs> so she kind of got picked on, you know, by the more popular kids. Um, after her diagnosis though, she chose not to tell other people. Um, and I think, you know, they were curious as to why she was gone and, and things like that. And then when she kind of got into middle school, I think she kind of found her own niche of other nerds that, <laughs> that, um, which is what we lovingly call her. And she called herself, you know, that she could sit by at lunch and kind of hang out with. Um, but I, I really don't think, or she never reported to me that she was bullied at all, um, because of her surgery, because of her scar, um, because of what she went through. And Douglas said, thank you very much. That's very helpful. Okay, good. 
So, okay. Well, we can end the session then um, if nobody has any questions. And I hope both of you are able to take advantage of all of the other wonderful free sessions that we're offering throughout the conference. It'll, it'll be an amazing conference this year. So thank you very much for sitting in. I appreciate your time and have a good rest of the day.